excited to have Frank here today. I'm going to give him a formal introduction, and then we'll bring Frank up. Uh, Frank Schaefer is a New York Times bestselling author. He's written numerous books, including Portofino, Keeping Faith, A Father-Son Story About Love, and the United States Marine Corps, Crazy for God, How I Grew Up as One of the Elect, Helped Found the Religious Right, and Lived to Take All or Almost All of It Back, and God Said Billy, and most recently, this book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, How to Give Love, Create Beauty, and Find Peace. He blogs regularly at Pathios. Frank is the son of Francis and Edith Schaefer, who gained worldwide fame in the 1970s as leaders of the religious right. Frank left that movement in the, in the 1980s and has since helped countless others in their struggle with faith and doubt. He's a much sought after speaker and has lectured at a wide range of venues from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government to the Hammer Museum at UCLA, Princeton University, Riverside Church, Cathedral, DePaul University. He's been interviewed numerous times on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The Today Show, and by Oprah. And uh, today, Frank is going to share uh, just uh, the, the, the experience of an honest, thoughtful man about his journey with faith and certainty and, and uncertainty and doubt and, and faith. And so uh, let's give a very warm One Church welcome to our special guest, Frank Schaefer. Well, thanks a lot for having me out here. Uh, this is a real pleasure. I'm going to be flying back to Boston tonight, sort of, <laughs> if, if we can get there. Um, I'm not used to actually a straight view in a parking lot anymore. There, you know, you're kind of looking over snowbanks and things. It's uh, been an interesting year. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about this new book of mine, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. And by way of introduction, <clears throat> talk a little bit about my own background. You know, you meet someone on an airplane and they say, what do you do? And of course, in our materialistic, consumerist, capitalist culture, what they mean is, what's your job? And your job is your identity. They're really asking you how much money you have and are you an important person. If uh, someone asks me what I do, um, if I'm honest and, and give a, uh, the answer that I actually feel, uh, I do not talk about being a writer. I talk about the fact that I'm fortunate enough that out of my three grown children, my uh, youngest son, who's married, lives across the street from me and has three children, Lucy, six, Jack, four, Nora, Rose, ten months. And what I do is take care of these children. Uh, I also peripherally do some speaking, do some writing to make sure that I can uh, buy presents for Lucy, Jack, and Nora. Um, but that's what I do, and I am not being facetious. Everything else is just a footnote. Uh, it's a blur, and it really doesn't matter. Because in the final analysis, what matters to me is a 62-year-old grandfather who also has two grandchildren living in Europe, Amanda, who's 21 and at the University of Helsinki studying sociology, Ben, who's 19 and in Brussels finishing high school, my daughter, who's always the same age as my marriage because I got my girlfriend, Jeannie, pregnant when we were 17 and 18. We're still together 45 years later, amazingly. Um, I'll, <clears throat> I'll tell Jeannie you applauded her and she'll say, you know, you son of a bitch. I mean, they, they have no idea. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you do the math and then your daughter goes to NYU and drops out to marry this Finnish jazz player who's studying in New York and goes off and writes film scores in Finland, uh, then you wind up with grandchildren who are the age of your friend's kids because they waited until they were 40 and then they had one frozen egg left and it worked and they went <laughs> off and had a baby. So basically my life is odd because my young grandchildren are the age the grandchildren are supposed to be if you're a white middle class American. My older children are the age grandchildren are if you're in a third world country or you got your girlfriend pregnant in a fundamentalist commune in Switzerland in the 1970s. Try that for an interesting experience. Um, and so I don't quite see life in the cookie cutter, education, career, job, do things at the right time in your life that makes sense, and, you know, have enough money in the bank. I have always been self-unemployed. I have always been someone who has kind of gone at this backward. And so my perspective as a writer that I bring these days in a book like Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God is not a footnoted treatise on something. My approach is simply this, and that is there really are no facts. And I'm not talking about religion. I mean everything, including physics. Just the relationships of quantum physics to Einstein's theories is enough to blow even a layman's mind who doesn't even understand, like I don't, what I'm reading. 
But when it comes to life, there are no facts. There are simply the stories we tell each other to try to make patterns and sense of this inexplicable mystery we participate in. And this mystery can be summed up like this. You are a biological machine. There is no person in you. Brain chemistry tells you that there is no one home. There is just a brain that thinks it's somebody because evolution has given you that gift to help you survive. But you look at the world through a pair of spiritual eyes in total contradiction to everything that brain chemistry is telling you. Now, back in the day, when I was in the evangelical world, I would have tried to find some clever way to make these two opposites conform. And what this book is about is a very different thing. And that is that the mystery of life is indeed a mystery. No footnotes need apply. And you can either accept the paradox and deal with it, or spend the rest of your life, if you're a person of faith, worried that you don't have enough faith because obviously none of this can be true. Or if you're a person of science and you have faith in brain chemistry and neurological science and so forth, spend the rest of your life wondering why it is when you pick up your version of Lucy, Jack, and Nora and say, I love you and you feel that deep and passionate spiritual bond, how that is explicable simply from evolutionary su survival skills. So you can either spend your time on both sides of this divide, becoming militantly uh, fundamentalist in your views as a secular person or as a person of faith, militantly fundamentalist in a protective sense of knowing that your position can't cover it, because the mystery is so profound it cannot be explained, or you can read my book, <laughs> and come to some understanding of how to give love, create beauty, and find peace through accepting the fact that some things cannot be resolved and embracing the paradox not as a challenge but as a gift. And it is the gift of humility. It is the gift that Jesus gives us when every time he confronts his Bible, which was the Torah, he questions it and says, well, I don't quite believe it. Think about it. Every time Jesus confronts his own scriptures, what we would call the Bible, he is not an evangelical Protestant taking an inerrant view of scripture. This is not even a holy book to him in the sense we mean it. Because he says, here's what scripture says. And then this very powerful heretic word that would get him thrown out of any evangelical community. But Here's what I'm telling you. Think how that would go down in the morning service in your average Southern Baptist church. Here is the gospel reading, or here is the thing from Paul, or whatever. Here's what it says. But you know, this isn't really what is true. Here's what I'm going to tell you. So when you think about the ministry of Jesus, what you are confronted with is someone who has been branded a religious figure, who is not only irreligious, but challenged the very essential scripture of his own tradition and didn't do that simply verbally, which he does, for instance, with the woman at the well who comes to him and even she knows better. And she says to him, you should not be talking to me. Wrong tribe, wrong religion, and we are enemies, in addition to which I'm a woman. And this is the Middle East, okay? And uh, what, what are we doing having this conversation? He says, well, your tradition and my tradition don't matter. It doesn't matter what mountain you work on, as, worship on as a believer, i.e. your theology doesn't matter. Your tribe doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't obviously matter to Jesus, who hung out with women in a period of history when no one did that. Uh, what matters? Well, we're coming to a time when your theology, your tribe is immaterial, and what is going to matter is worshiping God in, in spirit, in other words, not judged by the material universe of, of reality, true, false, in, out, saved, lost. Spirit and truth. Truth being something bigger than his own religious tradition. Do you understand what I'm saying? Something that cannot be quantified by saying, here's the chapter and here's the verse. And it isn't only in that challenge of scripture that you see this. You also see it very clearly in his inner relationship with other people. Jesus allows a bleeding woman, a second-class citizen in the Middle East today as it was yesterday, to not only touch him but blesses her for doing so instead of saying, now I'm defiled, damn it, and I'm going to have to go through this whole ritual of cleaning because I've been touched by a bleeding woman. How dare you? That's the response of his period of history. But Jesus is from a different period of history that hasn't even happened yet. The message of Jesus Christ is like something from a future that we have not realized even in this present. 
and comes uh, as far into his period in time as it would be for him to say EMC squared to a Middle Eastern audience 2,000 years ago and look at the blank faces. His relationship with people left them floored. And of course, we don't really know any. You know, people say Jesus did this, Jesus did that. Um, but of course, what we really mean is we have read something written down by other people about what was said he did. So let's be honest, we don't have any first hand information here. But according to what has been written down by other people often a long time later about things that were said about this person, who Jesus was, as well as how he related to the word, was one thing for sure. He was not a Christian in the sense we mean it. He certainly was not an evangelical. He would not be accepted into any church with a statement of faith on a kind of fundamentalist level, whether it's evangelical, Catholic, or anything else, because he came in and said, well, this scripture's all very nice, but fundamentally... Uh, here's what I say. Now, here's the odd thing. I come from an evangelical tradition that said that Jesus was the Son of God and also the Creator. And so you would think that the only way people who believed that sincerely would read their tradition, not just their scripture, but their tradition, would be using Him as the lens through which to look at their tradition because they've just said He's God. And yet they read their tradition through the lens of the people who killed them. They do not read it through the lens of Jesus who said, the book may say this, but I'll give you something else to think about. And that is spirit and truth, empathy and consciousness trump the book. Reality is what matters, not what's written here. Who you are and the content of your character is what matters, not whether you're keeping these stupid little rules. And that is a whole different deal. And that is where Jesus parts company with the church who has followed him in his name. And always has. Jesus' word has not been fulfilled at any period of history, yet by any kind of organization, it remains to the future. And the way I look at Jesus' intervention that I talk about in this book is as follows. We come from an evolutionary background. We were all single-celled creatures floating around in the, in, in the muck two minutes ago. We develop consciousness. Consciousness develops empathy. We have this idea of self and personhood. And the message of Jesus Christ is as if it comes from a future where evolution has actually achieved the promise of empathy that we don't see yet because we're still burning each other to death in cages. That's who we are. So when the atheists say to me, oh, well, the problem is religion and fundamentalism, I laugh. At, really, I don't really laugh at them, but I laugh inside uh, because the problem is not the label you give yourself. The problem is you. And you are not a sinner. What you are is a semi-evolved, barbarous primate that just fell out of the trees. And you treat people around you like crap. And I'm not talking about them. I mean me and you. Our problem is the human race. Our problem isn't how the human race labels itself male, female, gay, straight, black, white, feminist, progressive, conservative, Republican, Democrat, American, Russian, or Muslim. Our problem is that we are semi-evolved primates. I was in Africa directing a movie before I got out of the film business back in the day and living in Namibia and South Africa for a year. We were making a big action picture out there and, well, it was a small, crappy action picture, but... <laughs> It was a big commitment of my life. Um, but on the cliffside next to us in Namibia in the Swakop Valley was this whole troop of baboons. And if you live near a wild animal group for long enough, you kind of recognize who's who. Sex is always rape. Male domination is by murder. This is who you are. Deal with it. So our problem is not that we haven't read Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or Frank Schaefer or gone to the right seminar, or attended church, or accepted Jesus. We are primates, and we are semi-evolved. The miracle is not, the question is not, why do bad things happen? The miracle is they don't happen all the time, that some sex is love, that some parenthood is not just smashing little children over the head that some relationships are not just molesting, murder, and rape. That's the amazing thing. And that amazing thing comes from this fantastic gift we've been given of consciousness and empathy. And it is to that empathy that Jesus speaks, and he advances the game 10,000, 100,000 years, who knows how long this will take, 
to a point where you have a picture of where this could go. That is the miracle. And that is who Jesus is. And he had no effect even on the rest of the writing of the New Testament. Think about it. Paul understands, it seems, that Jesus who talks to the woman at the well or allows the whore to pour perfume on his feet and writes this verse saying, there's neither Greek nor Jew, Gentile, free nor slave. Oh, he was listening. Or he heard about it. But two minutes later, he looks around at all the women in the congregation and says, sit down, shut up, don't even pray in church. What? I mean, who... Did you, who was this guy? Well, the guy who said that other stuff is somebody trying to build a religious organization in a misogynistic Middle Eastern culture that has to put people in their place, otherwise he can't ever get anybody to come to his church in the same way that a large congregation of evangelicals suddenly is cut in half and two-thirds of the people disappear when they perform the first gay wedding because now it's like we're not playing the evangelical game anymore. So the people building the New Testament church were playing the game of the time. A game, by the way, that goes on till this day. And you see this battle in Scripture that Jesus had with his own tradition and every religious person around him. And it continued in the very book that's supposed to be his biography. And all I have to say is Jesus should have gotten a new agent because it's a, it's a lousy biography when you look at the whole thing in terms of people who read it through any other lens but his. It only makes sense in any way when you take the lens of empathy and judge what you read according to who this person was that our tradition says is God. It is ridiculous to define the God we say we worship by a book about that God rather than by the reality that we see around us. And so that is a very different approach. I want to <coughs> share a little bit um, of this book with you because I'm actually here on a book tour and I have to sell some books otherwise I can't afford the cactus I'm bringing Lucy and Jack back. <laughs> and, uh, so, and, 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 uh, uh, and so forth. But I want to give you a flavor of this book that's a little different than what I've been saying. There's um, a little paragraph I want to read that kind of underlines what I've been talking about here and then I want to jump to another place. And I've written a book that is mostly telling stories out of which my own life comes and trying to understand some of these paradoxical questions. But here's how I would just sum it up in one paragraph. My brain is not evolved enough to reconcile the, colli the collision of my genetic imperative with transcendent experience. My brain recognizes but can't explain how love and beauty intersect with the prime directive of evolution, survive. Nor can I reconcile these ideas. I know that the only thing that exists is this material universe, and I know that my Redeemer liveth. Depending on the day you ask me, both statements seem true. And I think that what you have to understand there is that usually somebody would finish that sentence and try to veer one way or another, sort of a Clintonian triangulation between opposites. But actually there is none. There's no meeting between those two things, and it isn't that one cancels the other out. This is really quantum theory up against Einstein's law of relativity. It's like you're describing two different universes, but hey, here we are. That is reality. Now I want to jump from that into something else, give you a little taste of the book, but also make a, a larger point, hey, harking back to what I said before in terms of, well, what do you do? I happen to go to a Greek Orthodox church. I like liturgical worship. I like this worship, too. But anyway, you know, life's weird. You wind up in odd places. Uh, and I've been doing this for 25 years. So we take communion by forming a line up to a chalice, and everybody gets fed like a baby with a spoon, and we pretend there aren't germs. <laughs> <coughs> and so, um, although I must say, if somebody's really sneezing a lot in the line ahead of me, it's like my heart, i just saying, oh, man, oh, man. Uh, what am I doing here? Quantum theory be damned, you know. I'm out of here, man. I'm just going to do coffee hour today. Okay, so anyway, that said, um, I say the Nicene Creed. I say the words, I believe, this and that. I say these words in good conscience because saying I believe in God is not the same as saying I know what those words mean. I don't. Words fall short. I don't know what words such as light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father mean. 
Then again, I don't know what the words, I love you, genie, mean either. I say those words with all sincerity, too, but in my blind ignorance of their ultimate meaning. Rational argument is not the point. I know I love Jeannie because I find myself cleaning the house in anticipation of her return from a trip. I find myself putting flowers in her office and in the kitchen. I do these things without thinking. These actions are as close to proof of love as I will get. The actions are not an argument, but evidence of a love that seeks to make the daily life of one woman as blissful as possible. Neuropsychology and religion are not the point. The point is that Jeannie walks into a clean house, and there are flowers. And that is in spite of the fact that I have sometimes treated her horribly. I say the words, I love you, and I know I mean them, though, because I take half a day to clean, to shop for flowers, to think about taking Jeannie to bed, to experience a flutter of anticipation resurfacing uh, as she walks out of the airport concourse, and I see her again. Yet, while waiting for her there, I've been casually watching a flight attendant's ass. <laughs> I've been a saint and a sinner, a jerk and a better man than I once was, loved by my wife, children, and grandchildren, yet sometimes still a tyrant. The words of the creed and my words of love are metaphors for something that is ultimately indescribable, but ever-present and never perfect. What I know is that whatever the creed means, I have been overwhelmed by love, I have seen light of light in action, felt its power while not understanding from whence the light pours into me. I was shuffling forward in the communion line with Lucy, at age three, in my arms. I was lost in gloomy thoughts, brooding on my past and my doubts, my failures and my meanness to Jeannie when I was young, stupid, and so woefully controlling. I was feeling that going to church was a waste of time. I was feeling unworthy in every sense of the word and sinking into gray depression. Lucy and Jack are always in and out of my arms in church as they have been since they were born, so I'd actually forgotten I was holding her. These days I hardly know how to be in church without a grandchild riding on my hip. With my head bowed and my eyes closed, I shuffled forward to the chalice to receive the body and blood through a ritual I don't comprehend and that seemed entirely pointless that day. I was adrift in my melancholy, then I felt a touch of Lucy's hand on my face, and startled, I opened my eyes. It took me a moment to remember where I was. Lucy was gazing into my face. She wasn't smiling, just gazing at me in that straightforward way that only a child achieves, with serious concentration and offering me a transparent look that had no agenda. She wanted nothing from me. All I saw in Lucy's expression was unconditional trust. All I saw was a child who knows me now and who never expects anything but kindness from me. She did not know of my past sins, failings, and bitter self-accusing regrets. Lucy was not judging me. I was accusing myself while she was just gently touching her Ba's cheek, checking to see why my eyes were closed. Lucy inclined her head and kissed me. This thought crashed into my brain. I am being seen as I'd like to be perceived, not as I see myself. I have seen the face of God. And to me, that's why I bother going to church for a few moments that actually happen in that contemplative place. But moreover, I think that through those serendipitous encounters is where actual faith takes place. It's not in the study of religion. It's not in one more Bible study. I'm not saying these things are useless. But it's in the actual experience of life, looking at, for one moment at those around us through the eyes of Christ and seeing them and being seen by them as we wish we could see ourselves. Isn't that the greatest gift? Imagine if I could ma wave a magic wand over your head now so you could see yourself as you wish you could be seen. What a gift that would be. In Dante's Inferno, there's a passage where Dante is coming out of the circles of hell that he's been going through, and he's just about to enter paradise. And I thought of this after I wrote this chapter, or I might have included it, maybe some future book. I was reminded of it listening to a wonderful BBC Four program 
uh, in, a, in a wonderful reading of the, of the Inferno that I hadn't thought about for years. And in those last sections, he arrives at the gates of paradise and he's told by an angel he must drink from two streams before he can enter paradise. The first stream is a stream of oblivion that takes away every memory of everything of which he is ashamed. Everything. It's gone. The second stream reminds him when he drinks of it of every good thing <laughs> that ever happened to him and every beautiful thing he ever saw in his life. And in that condition, Dante enters paradise. And to me, that is the gift of the gospel. The gift of the gospel is to find in a tradition uh, a, 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 a Lord and a Savior who sees us as we wish we could see ourselves but who literally, like my granddaughter Lucy, simply looks at us with the eyes of unconditional trust and love. So from my own spiritual journey, uh, and I'll kind of wrap it up here a little bit, I would just say that I have changed from being a person of the book to someone that looks for the truths of who I am in my journey much closer to home. Um, Lucy, when she was about three years old, uh, got a good idea of of uh, putting a cloth napkin over a candle when I was in the kitchen and I came back to see this sheet of lovely blue flame curling up to the cedar ceiling uh, got the barbecue tongs out of the kitchen put it in the kitchen sink and ran some water over it and all was fine and I came back in and Lucy was very worried and said I'll never do that again Bob very wide eyed and I got down on my knees I don't mean in prayer but the way you do with a little kid um, to be at eye level and I said Lucy I just want you to know something there's nothing in this house I love more than you. And if you had burnt this house down, I would not have cared as long as you were okay. Because the only thing here right now that I love is you. And the relief, you know, on her face was just massive. So I thought to myself after that, wow, 40 years ago with my little daughter Jessica, who by the way is literally my best grown-up friend, and we Skype three or four times a week. She's in Brussels, just called me uh, yesterday morning in this hotel. Um, and so great gift of, of, of love and so forth. That said, I look back with horror on how strict I was. My idea of what it meant to be discipline, disciplining a child. What a son of a bitch she had for a teenage, un insecure Calvinist father who thought he had been char put in charge of the universe as a man, was going to boss his wife around, tell his children what to do, slap them if they did something bad. And I was contrasting in my mind the response Lucy got from the, from the, I'm 62 now, but from the then 60-year-old version of me and what my daughter suffered through as a child. And I was thinking to myself this, and this is what I want to conclude with. If one individual, flawed individual, semi-evolved primate, can have an arc of empathy learning that follows that curve, how unimaginably stupid it is to think that we are part of a religious tradition that says the creator to whom we are all Lucy, the father and the grandfather, the great creator, if there is one, has a theological system that if you don't get right, he will burn you forever. Now this is stupid, not just on the basis of who Jesus was and the fact that nothing in Jesus' teaching or life in terms of the way he confronted his own tradition, speaks of that kind of vengeance and hatred. But it's stupid just on the basis of knowing yourself. If a semi-evolved primate can have an empathy curve that winds up in a place where literally from my heart, not putting on an act so she'll remember and tell her grandchildren this crap, but a real instance of just saying, hey listen, you know, there's nothing here I love more than you, and that's my reaction to something that was actually pretty, pretty hairy for a minute. If that becomes the natural reaction of somebody like me, Imagine the blasphemous hatred of God in the evangelical faith that says your creator will burn you forever if you get the details about him wrong. I mean, can you imagine knowing how I feel about my grandchildren that if they thought I had six arms or eight arms or two heads or five names or there were four of us or I was a female or I didn't exist at all, I never had happened, they never met me, that I would say, okay, that's it, burn them forever. It's unthinkable. And I am simply the evidence of the creative force of this creator in a mysterious universe which is in process. We have not evolved, we are evolving. 
and the hope that I find in the tradition of Jesus that I talk about at length in the last third of this book is that that evolution comes to an end point in that we can see what the future looks like. Not the destiny of the human race, but the destiny of empathy. And it's Jesus after he's been on the cross and the first words he utters are, fear not. <clears throat> that's what we tell the Lucy in our life and that's what we tell ourselves. And when we look in the mirror, the message of Christianity is fear not. That is the only gospel worth hanging on to. Thank you.